All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to uh, Stanley Garland Words of Grace. And we're here today to talk about James chapter 1 for our class meeting Bible study. So I would like to welcome everyone back uh, to that. And I'm excited that everyone has come uh, to talk about the amazing book of James. Now, uh, you may see um, some really exciting things in the book of James. And the book of James is considered wisdom literature, and we call it wisdom literature because it's very deep, it's very profound. There's a lot of very important doctrinal truths in there. So let's, let's just look at the book of James itself first, and let's think about um, its authorship and where James comes from. And uh, let's learn a little bit about James. Well, we know that James was the uh, half-brother of Jesus. And I say half-brother because we know that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. But um, he was born of the Holy Spirit. So we, we say that James is the half-brother of Jesus. So it's important to remember that James... Uh, is one of the leaders of the church of, of the Christian church in Jerusalem after Christ uh, dies and is resurrected. Um, so James kind of leads the church in Jerusalem. And since he does have that close family connection to Jesus, he's uh, considered an authority and very important to understanding the mind of Christ because obviously, he grew up around Jesus and probably spent a lot of time with Jesus himself. And one important thing that we see about him having that close connection with Jesus is that James quotes Jesus verbatim. Now, if we, uh, those who study the, um, the uh, Gospels, there is, it's believed that there was a text that was originally written uh, of the someone, one of the disciples probably wrote down a master copy of the teachings of Jesus. And the different disciples that wrote the Gospels took that text of that original text of Jesus' teachings and they used that when they wrote uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so forth. So they all wrote uh, based off of that text, you see. Well, um, when James quotes Jesus, he doesn't quote from that um, exact wording that's used in the other Gospels. Uh, and this is another reason why we have a high authority for the book of James, because if you were an actual person who listened to the Lord as he taught and was on this earth, then you would have heard firsthand his teachings and you would not have to copy from the uh, supposed original text of his teachings that were used by the other writers of the Gospels. Because James was there, he was probably present for many of Jesus' teachings as he was present there in Israel as Jesus uh, traveled and uh, went along with his disciples and uh, as he taught uh, the multitudes, he would have heard it firsthand. So his account of it would be uh, the same yet slightly different in wording because it was his original uh, reproduction of Christ's word. So we see a lot of uh, Christ's sayings of Jesus, uh, teachings of Jesus, that are um, almost the original, uh, that are the, the story that we hear in the Gospels, but uh, phrased slightly differently. So that's a very interesting point to make as we um, go into James. Now, there are some scholars that believe that a different James wrote, um, wrote uh, the book of James. I, however, do not subscribe to that uh, 
to that uh, possible take on it because I believe the tra as tradition passed down to us from the patristic fathers, the early uh, Christian fathers who were the next generation after Jesus, and they attest that it was in fact James, the, the half-brother of Jesus that taught it, so uh, that wrote it. So uh, since the early uh, bishops and early Christian fathers of the church said it, I'm going to believe it because it's good auth authenticity. Uh, we can take it on their word. Also, for reasons like I just stated, that if uh, it makes perfect sense that a person who was there to witness uh, the Gospels written um, would have phrased it in his own way, yet accounted for the same saying of Jesus or story of Jesus. So that gives us a lot of credence to the story of James as the author, James the uh, relative of Jesus, who, uh, in other words, Joseph's son, Joseph's natural son, um, who wrote the book of James. So we'll see, and I'll comment more on some of the things that give us this uh, claimed authenticity of James as the author as we go through the book. Um, something that a friend of mine uh, pointed out the other day, as this is wisdom li literature, it's called, um, and some people believe that the book of James is just sort of a, um, a compilation of wisdom and of information that, uh, and there's not necessarily a rhyme or a reason to it. Uh, but as you will see, as we go through the book of James, there is a logical progression that James uses as he teaches James and as he teaches uh, the, the information he wants to get across, which is uh, a lot of about the law and the grace of Jesus Christ, salvation and the works are some themes that we see throughout the book of James. So that's definitely something that we will uh, be looking into as we go along through it. So let's dive on in. And let's begin with chapter one of the book of James. Now, if you want to, uh, you know, follow along with me, I'll be reading from two different versions of the Bible. Um, I'll be reading from the good old King James, uh, 1611, uh, which is the traditional text. I'll also for the that's for the traditional reading of the of the word, and then if uh, when I'll be referring as well to the modern English translation, which is extremely reliable, uh, which is the English Standard Version, the ESV. So uh, when I refer to the original uh, traditional text uh, that many of us grew up with, I'll be referring to the King James, which I'll be reading from. And then when I want to, to state that scripture in a modern context, I'll be referring to the ESV, which is a wonderful and very accurate uh, translation, might I add. Um, the NIV is not bad either. So if you want a modern uh, translation, those two are excellent choices. New King James isn't shabby. Uh, that's not a bad choice uh, if you like that one as well. Um, so... Uh, if you were, have been following my posts, I posted my notes for uh, chapter 1, verse by verse. Uh, we call these expository notes because they go verse by verse through the scripture. And that's what we're going to do. So let's look at verse 1. It says, um, I'm going to read it in the traditional text. It says, James, the servant of the Lord and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes, that are scattered abroad, greetings. All right, so James uh, begins with the typical epistle Greek letter format. He addresses those who he's writing to, and he greets them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first off, there's something important to notice that James, while he is the earthly brother of Jesus, he does not... Um, claim any high authority to himself. Of course, people knew who he was, especially those he was writing. They knew the authority with which he spoke. But he addresses himself as James, the servant of God. Now, that word servant is the word doulos, which means in Greek, which means a servant or a slave 
of God. So uh, he did not, uh, this was a humble way of introducing himself. He could have said, uh, this is James, the uh, brother, son of Joseph. He could have claimed uh, the, his authority, which he rightfully probably has. Um, but no, he says, I am the servant of God. Um, so that makes us think that we should not get too puffed up in titles and in authorities. You know, uh, when I was younger, I really got in, got, um, I bought, took a lot of stock in uh, titles and degrees. And I went to college and I got a whole bunch of them, uh, two or three graduate degrees. Um, but in the end, I began to learn that uh, these degrees, although they are wonderful and do help us, uh, we can't let it puff up our ego and think so much of so highly of ourselves because of them, because in the end, we are simply the servant of God. And so he says that he is the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he puts himself below Jesus. So he says, Jesus Christ, he may have been my half-brother, but I am here and he is here. So he shows clearly where he stands in relation to our Lord. And he said he addresses his letter to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered uh, throughout the world. Um, so what 12 tribes were he, was he referring to? Well, of course, he was uh, talking to his fellow Jews. Now we know that the first Christians uh, around the, the, the world in that day were mostly Jews. And when the missionaries left out from Antioch, when they left out from Jerusalem, and they went on these missionary journeys, they would, of course, go to their fellow Jews. They would go to the local synagogue in these cities throughout Asia Minor, today Turkey, and throughout uh, the Roman world. And they would first go to the Jews because the Jews understood the God Jehovah. So those were the ones, you didn't have to reteach the whole story of God uh, because they understood that portion already. And there were also people, especially uh, in and around Judea, that were Gentiles, Gentile converts to Judaism. They were not allowed uh, full membership, full uh, participation in uh, the rites of Judaism in that day, but you see they were allowed to worship Jehovah. They had a special place in the temple in Jerusalem where you see there was a, uh, a curtain or a veil, it was called in Scripture, that separated the court of the Gentile converts from the court of the Jews. And we see that important event when Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says that the veil or the curtain was ripped asunder, was ripped in two. And that separation between Jew and Gentile was gone. God removed the wall of separation between us Gentiles and between the Jews so that we can both approach God. We can both approach the Holy of Holies. We can all approach uh, God, uh, our supreme and holy and complete sacri sacrifice for all of mankind. So let's go on into verse 2. And he says, greetings, my brethren. So when he says brethren, he is, of course, uh, addressing the Jews, and when it and back in verse one, when it said the Jews that were abroad or throughout the world, that the word was diasporos in Greek, that meant the di diaspora, the Jews that were spread around the world in the diaspora Jews, um, and we use that word today for different people groups that have been, um, uh, you know, uh, moved from their homeland and spread around the world, so. There was, uh, the Jews were merchant people. They've always been a highly an intelligent, because they studied the law. They, they were literate people from a young age, most of them. So they traveled around the world, and as they left, they tried to continue studying the Torah. 
and continue to learn about G about God, Jehovah. So that uh, made them to be usually some of the most educated and literate people in the communities that they moved to as well. So when you have education, that means commerce and trade, and that's why Jews have traditionally been wealthy and Jews have uh, been blessed of God. Um, he says, my brethren, referring to fellow Jews, count it all joy when ye fall into Temptations. So that's very counterintuitive because we think um, that temptations uh, are a negative thing. And of course they are negative. And uh, James will explain, uh, he'll develop this idea uh, of trials and temptations and we'll out in, in the subsequent verses. Uh, but you see here that James says that uh, don't... When you, you should be joyful, you should have joy when you fall into temptation. Um, number three, knowing this, that the trying or the proving or the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. So if you, if you go back to the Greek, that word that's that's um, translated patience in the King James uh, can be translated endurance or stick to steadfastness. It's translated by some people. So uh, when, when we are tested, when we go through difficulty, adversity, and trials, we understand that this will produce, will grow in us patience, endurance, endurance, steadfastness. Okay, so um, this uh, scripture has been misinterpreted greatly over the years. Probably all of us have heard some preacher over the years say to us, oh, you shouldn't pray for patience because that means God's going to send you hard times. Well, that's a terrible, terrible uh, exegesis or analysis of this verse. Um, so, First off, God, and James will explain to us uh, later on, that God does not send adversity into our lives. God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of evil. He does not bring bad things upon us. That is not the character of Jehovah God. He is a just God. He is a righteous God. He is a God of goodness. He is the light of he is the light of the world. There is no darkness in him, the scripture says. There is no darkness whatsoever. Uh, our God is a good God. He wants good things for us. He wants to prosper us. He wants to uh, enrich us, to grow us. Now, um, it says here that when you fall into these different kind of temptations, understand this, that this testing and this trying will produce stick to will produce steadfastness in you. Don't believe someone when they say to you that, oh, you should not pay, pray for patience because God's going to send you adversity. God's going to send you problems. Don't worry about that because we, the people who translated uh, James didn't have to use that word patience there. They could have used other words uh, just as well. There's no, this is not a magic formula. God understands, we serve a God that understands the meaning and the intents of our hearts, the Bible says. I have no worries that God, just because I say, oh dear God, give me the patience to endure the trials and troubles that come upon me in a prayer, that God is going to uh, send me hard times just to teach me a lesson. Now, if hard times come to me, God's not going to be the author of it, but God will take that hard time and through his grace and his mercy, he will help to mold me and make me and strengthen me and teach me that he's going to walk through with me all the way, all the way to the end. If you look on, if you're eager to find out what I'm saying, look on up to uh, verse 17 where James uh, explicitly tells uh, 
uh, this, explains this fully, but we'll get to that in a minute. But that's the verse that I'm referring to when I say that God is in no way the author of adversity in your life. He, is, he does not send you the hard times. The hard times are either one of two reasons. They're either one, uh, uh, the fruit of your poor decisions, uh, things that we've done, that we've brought onto ourselves. James later in this chapter tells us that most of the things, uh, the evils and the intents and desires of our heart, when we submit to them and succumb to them, that uh, these evil intents of our heart put us into problems and adversities, um, or that we do live in a spiritual world and there are things outside of us in the spiritual realm, uh, whether it be Satan himself or his minions or his uh, demonic uh, powers that uh, rule the powers of the air of this world, they can have an impact on our lives or perhaps other people and the evil intents and desires of their heart. So three reasons that uh, bad things and adversity could come upon you. It could be of your own making. It could be of the making of another that you're connected to that impacts you in some way. Or it could be from evil, satanic, demonic forces that are opposing you and causing misfortune and problems and adversities to uh, conflict with your Christian walk. So that those three reasons could be uh, why uh, adversity comes upon you. But I assure you it's not because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, brothers, he addresses his fellow Jews. Uh, he says, um, he doesn't notice too, he doesn't say if we fall into trials and temptations. He says when we fall into trials and temptations. So that too is important. Let's look over at verse 3 and 4. Uh, knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces or worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now this, being a Wesleyan Methodist, this is one of the scriptures that we look to for sanctification. You see, the sanctification is the process of growing in our faith, moving closer and closer uh, towards Christ's likeness and purity of heart and mind. You see, God gives us, gives us, pours out his grace into our hearts and lives. First, when we are justified by our faith through our uh, belief in Christ Jesus, we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. We accept him into our hearts. We confess him uh, unto salvation. We believe in our hearts that Christ has died for us. And once we are believed, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. He comes upon our darkened, sin-filled, and corrupted, depraved heart and mind. And it changes us. The new birth that uh, the Bible talks about ta uh, takes place. You remember Jesus when he talked to um, the rich man. He said, uh, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you be born again, unless you be born of water and the word, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you see that Jesus regenerates our hearts. He justifies or makes righteous our heart, puts our heart back into right standing with uh, God. That's when he justifies us by our faith and trust in him. But then after we are justified and we're saved or converted, some people call it, then he grows us in our faith as we learn about him, as we become more like him. And the Bible says that there is a metanoia, there is a metamorphosis that takes place in our heart as we conform ourselves more and more and more and more to be like him. And he says, I am holy, be like I am. So he wants us to become more holy, to become sanctified. That's what uh, that means. And he wants us to become more like him. So he says, let this steadfastness, this patience, have its perfect work in your heart that you can become more sanctified, more perfect, and entire 
are whole because God heals us. There is a progressive uh, part of this sanctification process as we proceed in holiness in Christ we begin to put on Jesus the Bible says that we put on our Christ likeness as you would put on a garment and you become more and more like him because we are we have put on Jesus we have put on his righteousness uh, as a covering of, of our sin uh, we become more like him. We begin to look like him because we have put on that robe of righteousness. We have put on Christ's righteousness. And it covers up this sinful, depraved heart that I have. And I become more and more like Jesus. And it says that you become entire, or that word in Greek means whole, healed, complete, Wanting nothing, lacking nothing. So let's look at that uh, same verse over in the ESV, in the modern rendering of it, uh, verse 3 and 4. It says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, or patience, and the steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. Lacking nothing, lacking in nothing. God wants to restore us. He wants to restore our heart. He wants us to become complete, whole individuals. That's why when Jesus would lay hands on someone, when he would heal them of their infirmities, uh, he would say, Be thou made whole. Be complete. Be sane. Be healed. And a lot of times Jesus would take it one step further and he would say, and your sins are forgiven you. So uh, not only when that, sometimes when we are uh, uh, saved and the Holy Spirit comes to our life and we be, are regenerated, sometimes God will heal us of many of the problems uh, that we have. Sometimes he'll do it immediately. Depending on, depending on if that is his will. But for most of us, the healing process comes through sanctification and we are made whole gradually as we put on Christ, as we conform ourselves to his will because, you know, when you get saved, you've been a dirty, nasty sinner. You've been a, a disobedient, rebellious, depraved person your entire life. Uh, and you, uh, it you have to let go of those sinful things. You have to put them away from you as you put on Christ Jesus and you conform yourself. And it, sometimes it's a slow process. And you know what, brother and sister, let me tell you something. I'm still trying to conform myself to Jesus every day. And I am, I far fall, I, f I fall far, far, far from the righteousness of Christ, as do you. You know, but as we grow in faith, we can come to higher levels of sanctification and higher levels of purity in our heart, mind, and action. And that's the goal that we strive for as we prepare ourselves, like Wesley said, making our, our soul uh, fit for glory. All right. So let's look in, in verse five. It says, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. Let's read it in the modern ESV, because I like it. It's even clearer. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, that it will be given him. Let him ask in faith, that's important, notice that part, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is tossed and driven by the wind. Okay, so we see here, this first part of verse 5 is important. If you lack wisdom, if you lack knowledge and understanding, the first thing that you should do is ask of God. Well, 
I can ask God through prayer. I can pray to God, which I do, uh, and ask him, Lord, give me your wisdom. Give me your knowledge. Give me your logos. Give me that mind of Christ. Um, you remember in John 1, let this mind, uh, excuse me, in, in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be um, to conform himself into the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, mankind, human beings, and being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself. He came down, he put on the flesh of humanity, he humbled himself, the almighty God of all eternity, of all the ages, humbled himself and became as a human soul, as a human flesh, so that he could become that acceptable sacrifice for us. The Bible says our propitiation. That means the, the only suitable fitting sacrifice that could um, meet God's requirement for the covering and the washing away of our sin. That was Jesus. So we have an unattainable goal of conforming ourselves to Christ. Now, one day we will achieve that when we go on to heaven and the Bible says that this mortal will put on immortality and this corruptible fleshly body will put on incorruption, that day, we, that's the time when we will become fully perfect, completely sanctified entirely uh, when we shed our mortal coil, as, as it's been said, when we leave this physical body completely and we put on that spiritual body uh, to go to meet the Lord uh, at the resurrection, then we will completely lose this sinful nature, this sinfulness, uh, absolutely, forever and ever, eternity. But while, here, while I'm here on earth, um, I have to uh, labor as a worker for Christ, as a servant of him, to uh, work towards sanctification and purity. If you lack wisdom, which we all do, because we all fall short of the mind of Christ, let's ask that of God. God, give us your wisdom. Give us your mind. Conform us to your will. He gives us, he gives to all men liberally, generously. Okay? You remember uh, Solomon prayed to God, God, give me your wisdom. And God gave him great wisdom. And he, uh, ESV says, he doesn't reproach us. Okay, he doesn't hold it, as, it against us that we don't have that knowledge. He understands who we are. That's why I don't have to worry about praying for patience that God's going to, bad Stanley, you shouldn't have prayed for patience. Well, no, I don't have to worry about that because I know that God understands what he's dealing with. He knows that he understands my brokenness. He understands the hardness of my heart. He knows that I'm dealing with this fleshly world and this fleshly body. However, he still calls me to repentance and righteousness in him because now that I'm saved, that I'm converted, I've been justified by my faith, he has indwelled me and you who have accepted him with his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit enlivens us and uh, restores in our uh, inner person a balance, okay? Just as the Bible says, just as with the first Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, you see, Jesus Christ was the second Adam, and with him came life. Jesus brought life, okay? The first Adam 
They brought death upon us. They brought the curse of sin and death upon all of mankind. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, brought us life. And he restored a right mind, a right heart within us. Now that I'm a Christian, I am not uh, overwhelmed by the, uh, my spirit is not compromised by its depraved sinful nature. Now I have the Holy Spirit in my heart and mind that can fight against the flesh. And he says, we are more than conquerors through him. So when I rely on the Holy Spirit to give me strength and guidance, then I can overwhelm this fleshly desire that I have, and I can live abundantly and rightfully and purely in him. But let him ask in faith, in verse 6 it says, notice that let him ask in faith. Something that I want us to see in the book of James, and we're going to talk a lot about faith, versus works in the book of James, faith versus works. And I hate that that uh, people who have taught James in the past uh, let faith and works battle it out. And there's you'll, there, people have written dissertations on uh, whether we are saved by faith alone or by uh, uh, works alone or a combination of the two. Um, but they are not separate things because if we're going to see later that the Bible says that faith and works are one thing. They are one thing. They are a composite. They work together. If you have one, you have the other. If you don't have one, you don't have either. Okay, so we'll see that in a little while. Okay, so it says, um, if you ask God in faith, because faith opens the door to God in our life. Faith opens the door. Faith gives us spiritual power. Faith gives us spiritual power through the Holy Spirit. So if we ask for wisdom and we do it in faith, not wavering, not disbelieving, not doubting, okay? Then if we're single-minded, then uh, he says that the person that doesn't ask in faith is not embracing uh, the Holy Spirit. They're embracing the flesh. So they're, war they're letting their flesh and their spirit war against each other, and they're like the waves of the sea. They're dashing around, uh, they have some faith, they have some doubt. They have some faith, they have some doubt. They're not allowing themselves to live solely in faith, but they're wafting all around, uh, being uh, like the uh, sea. They waver. Uh, they're driven by the wind uh, because they can't maintain that faith. Verse 7 says, For let not a man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So uh, if you notice, and if you read in the King James, it's a little diff more difficult to understand, but verse 7 follows verse 6. So in verse 6, he says that you must believe and ask for wisdom in faith. And if you don't, you're like uh, a wave of the sea that is tossed by the wind. He said, don't expect, in verse 7, he says, if, they, if you're going to be wavering in the wind, don't expect to receive of God. Okay, don't don't expect that person to receive anything of the Lord. So that this tells us in verse uh, six and seven that we should believe in faith for the things that we pray about. In this case, wisdom. Okay, knowledge of God, and that we should not expect to to receive anything from God if we are going to not proceed in faith. So we have to proceed in faith if we expect to receive something of God. And verse 8 fully develops that idea as it says that the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we don't want to be unstable. We don't want to be, uh, that word used for unstable is the opposite of uh, what he uses earlier uh, in the scripture. Um, 
here he says that uh, we, before when we talked about that we should be complete and perfect and whole and steadfast, okay, that we should have that steadfastness. Now, this is the opposite of that. Uh, the double-minded man, he's unstable. He's unsteadfast. See, so uh, in order to, uh, to uh, uh, endure through, uh, in faith, through the trials and the temptations and the problems of life, we have to re remain and persist and endure in faith. If we are not, if we waver, then we're going to be that double-minded man that's unstable in our ways. All right, verse 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass or a flower of the herb, he will pass away. All right, so um, here, uh, this is all about us uh, being joyful in our trials and our temptations and in the testing of our faith, being single and, and uh, having singleness, steadfastness of our mind. But then in verse um, nine here, it takes a turn and he says, well, uh, let me talk to those who are rich. He says, don't put your faith and your, your reliance in your wealth because wealth is like, it'll blow away. It's gone tomorrow. You place your faith in Jesus. So he says the person who is rich should humble himself and help his brother. The one who is poor should be exalted by the brother. So the rich, those who are gifted, those who are rich, those who have means, those who have resources should help those who don't uh, so that they can be brought up. Those who are who, who have uh, either, whether it be a intangible spiritual gift or, a, or, or earthly wealth, that person should help the lowly. The lowly should be brought up so that we all can be whole. He says, because wealth and, and riches are like the flower of grass that'll pass away. He says, for the sun rises up, the scorching heat comes down, it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. You know, I was telling a, a, a person I was talking to this week, I said, you know, um, a lot of times we men derive our, our, uh, we derive our identity from our jobs and a lot of the, we find who we are and what we do, but no one sits on their deathbed and says, I wish I had spent more time in the office. You know, um, all that wealth accumulation that we try to do, all that that we try to accomplish in our jobs and pursuing riches um, can be blown away tomorrow. Uh, we're going to leave that all here when we leave and, and we leave this earth from, you know, a dust you came and from dust you will return, the Bible says. So we can interpret that as earthly riches. We can uh, also uh, interpret that as an, an, in another way. Uh, a lot of a lot of the new Christians, there were wealthy Christians, there were aristocrats, there were nobility people of importance uh, in this world that were had become Christians. But there were also former slaves and current slaves and servants and the low classes. So person of High degree should help the person of low degree. Okay, so uh, both in a status as well is another way to interpret that scripture. All right, let's look on to verse 12. Uh, it says, For the sun is no longer risen from the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace and the fashion of it perisheth. So also the rich man fade away in all his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised him 
that love him. So this is one of those scriptures that uh, are, is very important. This scripture is very important because uh, this is uh, the scripture that many have used to say that we, uh, when we go on to our great reward in heaven, that God will give us the reward of a crown, a crown of um, endurance, a crown of life. Uh, we see also uh, this crown, if you look uh, in the book of, I believe it's the book of Revelation. Let me look in my notes here. Um, yes, Revelation uh, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says that a uh, crown of life is mentioned there uh, to believers that endure trials and temptations. So we will receive that crown of life uh, for uh for uh, enduring these temptations and uh, persisting in faith for Christ. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13 is very important because it speaks to the holiness of God. I'm going to read it from the uh, ESV. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, this is so important, I am being tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That's the one I was talking about earlier. God is not sending you trials. He's not tempting you. He's not sending you adversity. You know, earlier this year here in South Georgia, we had terrible storms from Hurricane Michael that came through. They devastated our community. Our house here was without power for days and days. Uh, people were without air conditioning. It was the, the heat index was 100. It was terrible, miserable time for many. Some of, uh, some of us even... Uh, had uh, our houses uh, torn up. Uh, some of our neighbors down the street had pine trees that fell over into their house. And uh, some people said in the community, they're like, well, you know, God won't put anything on us that we, can, that we can't bear. And I kept thinking to myself, God did not send that to you. That was not God. That was the principality and power of the air. That was from the pits of hell. That was from Satan. Satan is a destroyer. He's the author of confusion. My God, Jesus Christ, the Almighty in heaven, he is the author of, uh, of uh, wholeness and saneness. And he's a builder. He's not a destroyer. So let me tell you folks that Jesus did not send that hurricane. He did not send that tornado that tore up your house. He did not make the tree fall on your house. Now some things the Bible says happen simply by chance. Other things happen for a reason, and that reason may be something you did, like I said earlier. It may be something of your doing. It may be something of uh, you know, your... Um, uh, it may be a spiritual force working against you, but it's not Jesus. It's uh, the satanic forces that are working in this world uh, to cause harm to Christians and to society and to everyone because Satan wants to destroy God's plan. He wants to thwart God's plan. Uh, you know, if you look at the end of this book in Revelation, God wins. You see, he wants to uh, stop God's uh uh, eventual uh, supremacy of this world, but God did not send adversity to your to your life. Let no one say when he's tested or tempted that I'm being tempted of God, because God cannot be tempted with evil, and he cannot, and he himself tempts no one. God did not test you. God did not test you. He did not try you. He did not um, uh, bring adversity to you. Verse 14 says, but each person is tempted and lured and enticed by his own desire. And then, so first, it's a desire in your heart. So he, uh, he says, most of our sins come from our heart. The Bible says that the heart of man is utterly wicked. You know, there's a lot of evil in all of our heart. The most holy man that ever walked to earth outside of Jesus, who was perfect, but outside of Jesus Christ, even the most holy man on this earth that's ever lived had evil in his heart. That's like I tell my children. I said, people are not 
all bad and people are not all good. People are both good and bad, but the good people are the ones that embrace the good. So we have to look to the Holy Spirit. We have to look to the good that God has put in our heart, embrace the goodness, embrace the holiness, embrace Jesus, embrace the Holy Spirit that he can enliven and, and, and strengthen us to do that which is right. So he doesn't tempt us, and he tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desires of our heart are corrupt. We have that sinful Adamic nature from Adam. Adam, the Bible, I told you earlier, through Adam, sin came through one man, sin came upon all of humanity. And one, through one man, Jesus Christ, uh, righteousness and purity and holiness came in, in, into humanity. All right? So uh, it says here that um, we are tempted by our own desire. So the seed of our sin is our evil desires. That's why Jesus said, um, you know, you might not have uh, committed adultery, but you've done it in your heart because a man, if a man looks upon a woman to commit, a, uh, to lust after her, that's the seed of sin, then he has uh, committed adultery in his heart. So you see, the, the uh, sin, act, the action of sin begins in the heart with humans' evil desires. Verse 15, then, now see then the next step, then desire, when it is conceived, that word conceived there uh, means interjected, uh, when it, it is placed you know, like a seed that's placed in the ground and it grows and germinates, it gives birth to sin, it says here. Uh, that when desire is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. All right, so look at the process that James describes to us. It starts with the heart. Okay? Okay. With the heart, we conceive evil, we conceive sin, whatever it might be, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then that evil desire in our heart and mind gives birth or produces or generates a sinful action, a sinful deed. And when sin grows up, when it's fully grown, it brings forth death. So that's what Jesus said. He said, the end thereof is death. Sin. Sin brings death. Now, well, if I go out there and sin a bunch, will that get me killed? Well, there are some things that can possibly physically. But he, here James, as Jesus did, he's talking about spiritual death. Okay? Because spiritual death brings death. Uh, is is through damnation in hell. All right, so who was responsible here, according to James, for uh, bringing forth death? Well, you had A equals B equals C. So A was the sinful desire in our heart that produced B, B which was the action of sin, and then you continue on in sin, and sin brings Death, A, B, C, sinful desire, sinful action, death. How, what are they talking about with spiritual death? Well, the Bible tells us, uh, as you continue to read on, that uh, spiritual death uh, occurs when we go to hell as a result of these A, B, C that we just saw here in this verse. We send ourselves to spiritual death and hell because of our actions. We did it. We birthed that sinful desire in our heart. We acted on that sin, and it grew up into something ugly. And then we kept on doing those sinful deeds, and those terrible sinful deeds grew up into something even more ugly that caused us spiritual damnation, uh, and that spiritual death 
is what sends us to hell. So we are responsible for that. Don't ever say God sends us to hell, all right? God's justice sends us to hell because of our action, okay? That's like saying uh, I go out and shoot someone and murder them and then the judge sentences me to uh, life imprisonment or to the, de the electric chair. Who sent me to death? Was it the judge? No, the judge was simply administering justice. I sent myself to the electric chair because I went out and killed another person. And then justice came upon me and then I received death, you see. All right, so let's go on. Let's see here. It says, um, we are tempted by our own desire. The desire is conceived, birth, sin, and then sin brings forth death. Verse 16, be not deceived, my beloved brothers. Every, oh, this is, I love this verse so much. Every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. All right? Now, I'm going to go back and read this because I love this verse in the King James because it's so beautiful, beautifully translated from the Greek. It says here, uh, verse 17, every good and every perfect gift is from above.